We've gone over the basic structure of DNA. Now we're going to talk about replication. With replication, I want you to be able to explain the sequence of events involved in the replication and repair of DNA. So what does it mean to replicate something? To make an exact copy. This replication occurs during S phase, or synthesis phase, of, uh, of interphase. An exact copy of DNA is going to be made. Now, there are several important terms that I'm going to want you to know and be able to use when you're, I don't know, writing about this stuff. DNA polymerase, DNA helicase, the leading strand and the lagging strand, nucleotides, including ad adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, and understanding the difference between pyrimidines and purines. So here's the deal. We're going to replicate this strand of DNA. DNA is double-stranded. It's got all of these hydrogen bonds linking together, linking the two together. First thing you need to do is break those hydrogen bonds. And you can do that with an enzyme called a helic helicase. What does the word helicase look like? Helix. helix, because what does it do? It breaks a helix. So the helicase binds, and it breaks the hydrogen bond. It reduces the amount of energy necessary to break hydrogen bonds, it opening it up. So it breaks the hydrogen bond. Helicase breaks the hydrogen bond, opening up the DNA. So if DNA originally looked like a ladder. What the helicase does is it breaks a rung in that ladder. Once one piece is broken, the whole thing begins to unzip. In fact, helicase acts like a zipper. Uh, let's see. Anybody? Can I use your book bag real quick? Yeah. Thank you. I was going to do it anyway, which is awesome. All right. Behold, the zipper. The zipper is an awesome modern invention. Um, if you guys have seen period movies where they've tried to put people in outfits that look old, and you ever see a zipper, it's probably not a real thing. Here I have zipped up the book bag. And you'll notice it doesn't come undone very easily. So far, so good. You guys have all done this before. Uh, once it begins to unzip, once one of these tines is broken, what happens to the book bag? It, it's open. You guys, I'm sure, at one point in all of your lives have ripped a book bag by accident, ripped the zipper open. And then you couldn't ever get it to work again. So it's sort of like once you start breaking a single piece of that zipper, the whole thing begins to fall apart. And you can't put it back together. That's what the helicase does. It breaks that one tine. And then after that, the whole thing gets unzipped sequentially down. So helicase begins to break it apart, forming what's known as a replication fork. It's, got, it's uh, bidirectional. So the helicase is bound. Um, and you begin to break open the DNA. Shoot. Um, here's what I need, guys. I need somebody to give me their shoe if they have a shoelace. I don't have shoelaces today. In fact, here are my shoes today. That's what my shoes look like. They are uh, loafers because I was wearing my shoes out in the, rain, in the grass today. I was applying pesticides. Everything got wet. There's a long story short, I ended up wearing these shoes. Um, so I need somebody to give me their shoes. I am not taking the shoelaces out. I am just going to hold the, shoelaces, hold the shoe up by the shoelaces. All right, so here we've got uh, sh two shoelaces, right? They're right next to each other. If I twist it, it's a double helix. So far, so good? Now, you'll notice that I've got this double helix. If I was to open it up, what enzyme is going to start opening it up? Helicase. As it opens more and more, there's a lot of tension down at the bottom. That could break the strands. I'm not going to break the strands. But that could break the strands. How would you relieve that tension? In order to relieve it, you let it spin. And if it spins, the tension gets released, and now the two strands are totally separated. Thank you for letting me borrow your shoe. I'm going to watch out, Ashley. All right. Good. So that, that was, that was the, the big shoe thing, and I really should have brought the right shoes for that, but sorry. So helicase starts bringing it down. Topoisomerase relieves pressure. The DNA is stabilized. We're now producing a replication fork. So we split the DNA. Now we need to add new nucleotides to it. 
if our DNA strand was G A T T A C A, its complement is going to be C T A A T G T. They're bound with hydrogen bonds. So far, so good, right? The helicase comes in and binds and breaks that hydrogen bond. And then it's going to proceed forward, breaking the rest of the hydrogen bonds. Topo isomerase is on the end, spinning it around. So we're going through and breaking down these bonds. We've now formed a replication fork. Here's one stra double stranded entity. On this other end, you've got two strands. DNA pol um, polymerase is going to bind to one of those strands and follow the direction of the sugars. So if you recall, you got pentose sugars connected to a phosphate, connected to a uh, nitrogenous base. Purines connect to pyrimidines. And the other side is going in the opposite direction, like that. The polymerase follows the direction or the arrow of the um, sugar. As it's going, it's binding G to C, A to T, T to A, T to A, A to T, C to G, A to T. It's heading down the line. Because the sugars are facing in opposite directions, these strands are turned anti-parallel. It's just like a, uh, a street. You've got one direction on one side of the street, and on the other side of the street, you're going in the other direction. And if you were to break those laws, you would crash and die. Yeah, thanks for agreeing. I appreciate it. Uh, in my head, I was like, where do I go with this now? Um, so the polymerase always follows that directionality. That means that on the other side, you're moving in this direction, opposite. So we're going to go T to A, A to T, A to T, T to A, C to G. Now here's the problem. As the helicase keeps moving down, the bottom, um, the bottom polymerase can follow it. Because of that, this is called the leading strand, because the helicase is leading uh, the polymerase. Matching things up, matching, matching, matching. Over here, at the other end, if you'll notice, that has to keep going in that direction, the opposite direction. So you have to bind a, he, uh, a new polymerase up there, and it moves along, encoding backwards C to G, A to T, A to T, T to A, C, G to C. So far, so good? What you'll notice is this one at the bottom is really long, leading strand. These are called lagging strands. They're lagging behind, and they're little fragments. These are also known as Akazaki fragments. So you have a leading strand and a lagging strand. If you were to describe these, the way I would describe them is to say that the leading strand is going to be encoded continuously. The lagging strand is going to be encoded in small segments. This replication accuracy is very precise. There's less than one mistake per million nucleotides. Less than one mistake per million. Now that sounds great, except there are trillions of nucleotides in your cells. The reason this works is because hydrogen bonding between purines and pyrimidines is very stable. But if it's a purine and a purine bound to each other, or a pyrimidine and a purine, pyrimidine bound to each other, the bond would break down very easily. It's just not stable. Also, DNA polymerase cannot bind to mismatched sites. It sort of hits a mismatched site, and it stops. It's like um, if you've ever gotten something caught in your zipper. 
and then I'm talking zipper in your book bag. I don't care about the rest of your zippers. Um, as you zip it up, you end up running into whatever that blockage is, and you can't get past it. How do you get past that blockage? You unzip, you try again. You unzip, and you try again. And eventually, either you break whatever you're using, or it works. 50-50 shot. So here, that DNA polymerase um, is going to sort of back up and then try to repair what's in front of it. It actually can act almost like a, filling a pothole. It removes, if this was an error right here, it would remove the entire area around the error and then reattach um, new nucleotides. So DNA can check itself out with enzymes and then fix it. When does that happen? It's like taking the other concepts, right? Some other points. When do you check the DNA for damage? And G2 and in? Yeah, pretty much in all of them, metaphase G1, right? If there was a problem, what would happen? Go to G0, and during G0, it gets fixed or not. Or it doesn't, and you get the cell death. One way or another, the cell will get fixed. Now, this works really well, especially for bacterial chromosomes that are round. But the issue is, eukaryotic chromosomes are linear. They're straight lines. So you've got bits on the end. Because of the nature of um, uh, polymerase, it doesn't read all the way to the end of the chromosome. It leaves off about 20 nucleotides. It just, they just fall off every time. So there's another enzyme that comes along called telomerase. And telomerase adds like 20 random uh, nucleotides to the end of your chromosome. And that makes your the end of your chromosome, your telomere, stay the same length. Because if this kept, uh, this uh, polymerase kept copying the DNA and you didn't add telomerase, the chromosome would get shorter and shorter and shorter each time it replicated until eventually you started eating into the, um, the DNA, the genes. And that would be bad. The cool thing is, this allows cells to stay uh, replicative more often. They can stay, uh, continue to divide more readily and continue to pr continually produce good DNA. Children have telomerase that's constitutively active. It's working all the time. It works a lot. They've got so much more than adults do. And that makes sense. Uh, anybody ever break a bone when they were younger? OK. How long did it take for you to heal when you were younger? Not long. Eight weeks, so whatever, that's cool. It's not going to take long. You break a leg, and you're like, I'm up and working because I'm a kid, and I've got to go to a coal mine. I don't know. Um, kids can get broken and fixed because their cells have these constantly active uh, telomeres, which means their DNA doesn't get damaged, so they can uh, replicate and replicate and replicate, no issue. If somebody who was in their 80s broke their leg, how long would it take to heal? They're pretty much, yeah, just shoot them. They're, it's over. It's, it's, it's like out of their misery, they're done. <laughs> That's the end of that. Um, I know, but they're just going to they're gonna be limping around for the rest of their life. They're going to probably be in a wheelchair. Um, and it's partially due to constantly being able to replicate your own DNA. Now, there are some cells that will replicate DNA and continually replicate with absolutely no uh, uh, damage to them because their telomere is always on. And those are cancer cells. Certain cancer cells are going to be immortal. Literally, if you feed them nutrients, they will live forever. Their DNA doesn't break down. Uh, if you were to drive along Route 360, the sort of down from Richmond to the southern parts of the state, then um, you would pass a, one of those historic signs that says birthplace of Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta Lacks was a, um, she was an African-American woman, I think it was in the mid-50s where this happened, but I can't, I'm not terribly sure. Um, but what happened was she went to a university because she had cancer. And the university people said they would help her or they would study the cancer. So she signed paperwork. Now, she was illiterate. She didn't know what she was write, uh, signing. She just wanted to get better. What the, she had signed was a piece of paper that said that anything that they took from her was considered medical waste. So they removed cells from her, cancer cells from her, that they grew on plates. And it turns out these cells were immortal lines. They would never die. 
she would. She died uh, soon thereafter of cancer, um, but her cells lived in the labs. They didn't actually dispose of them. They weren't medical waste. In fact, they sold them to pharmaceutical companies to use for research into uh, cancer. And it then they then turned around and produced a whole lot of products based on her cells. Well, her family said that the, you, you literally have parts of our grandmother there. Um, should, should we have some compensation maybe? And the courts ruled against it. And they said, well, she signed this away. So here are people making lots and lots of money off of Henrietta Lacks cells. And her family gets nothing from it because she signed the paperwork. In this mini lecture, we talked about DNA replication, uh, the process by which a cell creates an exact copy of its DNA. We went through the molecular mechanisms in which uh, a DNA helicase is going to bind at the origin of replication and separate DNA into two strands. Uh, from there, primase is going to synthesize, create short RNA primers, and that pre creates a starting point for where DNA can start. It sort of primes the pump. It gets it started. DNA polymerase enzymes will then start adding complementary nucleotides to each template strand. So as we unzip it, DNA polymerase is sort of sliding one way down and then going in the opposite direction as well uh, because polymerase only ever um, works in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction. The leading strand, moving from 5' prime, prime to 3', prime, to three prime is being synthesized continuously. So it's one long belt being produced. The lagging strand going in the other direction sort of has to wait for bits of the DNA to become exposed. So it's created in little bits, little uh, chunks. And those chunks are glued or ligated together. Um, the chunks are known as Akazaki fragments. Over time, the two complete strands will form and you will have two absolutely identical copies of DNA. That's DNA replication. You're exactly replicating the DNA nucleotide by nucleotide. These content review questions will help focus your studies and our next mini lectures on the molecular mechanisms associated with transcribing DNA to RNA. So taking the nucleotide language and transcribing it into a, the same nucleotide language just with a slight difference in some of the letters. So uh, I'll see you in a few minutes.